Hello and welcome to a very special edition of GFW Radio. This is Jeff Green, the editor-in-chief of Games for Windows magazine, and I am here with Jeff Butler, the president of Sigil Games and executive producer of their very first game, Vanguard. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> How are you? Doing great. Uh, How do we have you? to do a Jeff 1 and Jeff 2 so people know who we are when, we, when we're talking? That is going to be confusing. Okay. Um, or we could be Butler and Green. That works. All right. Which is kind of more manly anyway. Um, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm I'm going to be scared with every question I ask you because if you could see in the studio here, if you're listening, Jeff is surrounded by PR handlers, like almost literally. There's like three of them behind him, except they're all, they all look like they're either on their cell phones or their sidekicks. So maybe <laughs> they're not paying attention. There's no chance of me getting out of line in this situation. <laughs> So all those tough questions I'm going to ask you, they're going to like be doing the you know throat cutting thing when you're talking. My back is turned to them though, so I'll just <laughs> ignore it. Okay. Well, thank you for coming in. My pleasure. Um, how are you doing, and how is the game going? The game's doing fantastic. Uh, everyone's been keeping busy, having a blast, putting the beta together. Um, it's just at that most exciting point in time where we're really able to sink our teeth into our work because we're getting feedback from the players on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably the most fun time in beta. Um, mm -hmm. All the developers are able to jump in the game in their off hours and on play tests, give one another feedback, build upon their work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's been fantastic in the last couple of months. How many people are, are playing right now, do you think, roughly, in the beta? I logged off earlier today. And there were about 940 people online. That's pretty good. Yeah. So that's like a pretty big pool of different opinions to be getting, right? Yep. I mean, on any given day. Yep. People have made it to level 40 so far. They're, we're level <laughs> locked in beta right now at 40. That's insane. Yeah. They've been hard at work. Who would... Eh, okay. I wouldn't do that personally. I just feel like, because okay, you're, you're going to wipe these characters, aren't you? We might transfer them over to a test server Ooh. after launch. Okay. We've talked about it. Hmm. I think it would be a nice thing to do. That would be nice. But it would just be test still, right? Exactly. So, huh. Not a live realm. Uh-huh. So um, are you getting feedback now that's, like, a lot different than what you were expecting? I mean, are things coming up that... You you couldn't possibly have imagined at the time you said, okay, let's let people play this game? Not so far, actually, because we've been in the game with them kind of from day one. So we're we're judging our own work and then kind of basing our own, you know, our, our, some of our own personal opinions on some of the feedback that we've generated internally and whether or not it's been reflected in the player base. A lot mm -hmm. of times we're the ones who find the exploits or find the problems with the games even before the players do. Mm -hmm. hmm. So nothing is as striking as, oh, damn, you know, we really didn't think of that um, kind of thing. We've been rebalancing and making some changes to the game, adding in this or that, uh, tweaking the economy. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been talking about things like bind upon equip and level limits um, fairly mm -hmm. recently mm -hmm. to, to manage the economy a little bit more tightly than, than we Level had limits past. of items, say? Mm -hmm. Item mm -hmm. level limits, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Uh, so the game is evolving even through in the, throughout the beta test, uh, but it's kind of a measured process. We're mm -hmm. right there with the players, mm -hmm. like I said, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So nothing really surprising so far. Mm -hmm. I guess that's good, right? I yeah. Mean, you're not going like, oh, God, what have we done? Yeah, we know we're going to have some emergent gameplay issues with some yeah. of our more advanced uh, our advanced encounter system and things like that, mm -hmm. um, and we have yet to see the effects of those things, but the beta will last a little while longer. Mm -hmm. We have that time. How much longer? Mm. Of course, I don't know when this is broadcasting, so whatever you say might be meaningless. We're planning a first quarter release next year. Okay. So a while longer. Okay. That's not a long while. Not too long, but long enough to figure out the high-end game, the rating, mm -hmm. all of those important issues. I, I think if we hadn't done it before, we'd want even longer than that. But it's kind of, you know, we've got a lot of past experience to compare to. Even the people right. who are new to the team were very avid players in the genre before they worked in the industry. So they've right. got a lot of perspective. Well, why don't we actually back up a little and, and tell tell people how long has this game now been in development? And maybe even just uh, tell us a little bit about how it, what the origin of this game was, how you and Brad decided to do this game. Well, we've been in development for a little bit over four years. By the time we launched, a little bit, a little bit more than four and a half years uh, in all likelihood. Uh, and the origin of the game actually 
started in the EverQuest days when we realized that um, EverQuest's sequel was not going to be able to have all of the fantasy game features that we could imagine for an MMO, Mm -hmm. not even in the short term. Technology, uh, lead time, all of those things were going to keep us from being able to make uh, EverQuest's sequel everything we would have liked it to be. Mm -hmm. Um, We had some had some ideas for uh, the diplomacy system, for instance, the non-conflict, uh, co- you know, combat resolution, uh, opening lore and quests and things of that nature, uh, a little bit more casual form of gameplay. Mm-hmm. Um, think of it like an open door, uh, which we found uh, in WoW, which, of course, launched after we started planning Vanguard, um, kind of lowering the barrier to entry, making more of an every man's game, at least to begin with, so that uh, there would be more critical mass. Mm-hmm. More people would come to the game. You'd have more chance to make friends, things of that nature. Um, that was really the genesis of Vanguard, wanting to make the spiritual successor of EverQuest with a lot better technology and right. the ability to go anywhere that you could see in the world, things of that nature. At the point, let's see if, I don't know if I have all my history straight here. At the point that, when were you and Brad out of Sony the first time around? Was it, had EverQuest 2 even started yet? Oh, yes. EverQuest 2 had been in development for quite some time. Um, I think, as a matter of fact, Brad was, Brad was, closely involved in the production of EverQuest 2. He may have been the executive producer or in that in that general slot when he left. He was VP, uh, creative director, okay. uh, acting as executive producer of EQ2, as I recall, uh, and had been in development for more than a year, if not mm-hmm. more than two. Um, and He left during the uh, development of the third EQ expansion, Shadows of Luckland, right. and I left right after Shadows of Luckland shipped. Okay. And hey, that was like the last expansion I played all the way through. So, there you go. Some coincidence there, perhaps. Uh, um, so, even though your Sony handlers are behind you, I have to ask: um, since you're saying uh, that you're thinking of Vanguard as a spiritual successor to EverQuest, does that mean to you that EverQuest Two is not the spiritual successor to EverQuest One? It was not for me. I'm speaking specifically as a mm-hmm. gamer. Um, mm-hmm. It was not the spiritual successor of EverQuest for me. But then I don't believe necessarily that they intended it to be so. Mm -hmm. Um, Knowing that EQ was going to maintain its own subscriber base, I think um, it became their intent with EQ2 to ship more of an every man's game. Mm -hmm. You know, something with a lower barrier to entry, but but a lot of depth, something that built up to the depth. You know, it is pretty interesting that, like, that EA and Origin could never get it together on an Ultima Online 2 despite I don't know how many attempts. I mean, it was going to be our cover story at least once. Yep, we had some developers who worked on that project Mm -hmm. early on in Vanguard days. So, I mean, at least whatever you think about EverQuest 2, at least Sony was actually, you know, competent enough to get a 1 and a 2 out there running simultaneously, whereas UO could never figure it out. Absolutely. But maybe that is, like, I still wonder about the cannibalism issue, you know. It's a very real thing with MMOs. Uh, it's one of those one of those issues that that kind of are going to plague our genre because it takes so much time to play an MMO mm-hmm. um, until we get to the point where they're so easy that you can manage two MMOs at once. Mm-hmm. They're they're pretty much always going to cannibalize one another. Right. I mean, to me, that's the very biggest issue, and it's of course the one that that we're that everybody's dancing around, not with your game, but with with every other game. It's like, I mean, obviously, WoW is the big elephant in the room but at some point whenever that is it's not going to be i mean maybe it will will be vanguard who knows what it's going to be but that's to me the big question right now wow is the big elephant in the room and how do you convince people who are already paying a monthly fee which is essentially like another cable bill or whatever mm-hmm. 15 dollars a month uh in addition to the hours they're devoting to the questing and all that to now do another one on top of that I mean, aren't, aren't you really having to ask them to quit WoW for Vanguard, realistically? To some extent, quite possibly, yes. Um, I think a lot of companies are going to be considering things like multiple entry points to a game where, for instance, let's say 
a sci-fi version of EverQuest Mm -hmm. where you can transfer your character back and forth between Hmm. the two worlds, where where a persona built in one game may be applicable in some way to one of those companies' other games, Hmm. where your progress gets carried over for you. My guess is in the future you're going to see stuff like that. Yeah. Because you just can't expect somebody to go back in and, and reinvest three years of time in characters over and over again. Right. I mean, it's funny. You're seeing it even the, the you know, minor backlash amongst dweebs with the Burning Crusade beta right now with people getting all pissed off that all this, all the hundreds of hours they've spent getting the, you know, the upper tier gear is now rendered useless. Useless with the new stuff at the lowest level of blue and green, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely the case. Um, And I was thinking about it the other day in terms of how would would Blizzard ever do WoW 2 at this point? They have the same problem as everybody else. Or World of StarCraft. Right. You know, here's here's a different genre, and we know that it would likely appeal to other players Mm -hmm. than, than the current game, but then it would cannibalize as well. My guess is that, you know, the cable subscription service is on everyone's lips uh, in relation to massively multiplayer games, the station players, uh, the station pass is a huge thing where yeah. you, know, you subscribe to one game for a certain price, you get all games at the yeah. same time. That's very helpful yeah. uh, because you can maintain your Star Wars Galaxies characters or what have you right. and continue to participate in, in any Sony game. I think that is certainly the wave of the future for the modern MMO mm-hmm. player. And then adding, at that point, it's just adding services, right? Right. Yeah, I think I agree with you. That to me seems like the kind of hook that would that might work. If somebody yes. knows they're paying fifteen dollars a month, but they're getting this, 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 and this, as opposed to this one game. Exactly. And in those games that require you to maintain your character or to go in, like in Galaxies, and maintain your guild house, put money in it so that it doesn't decay, I think that sort of service kind of it, it's going to ring true. Certainly, mm-hmm. Vanguard uh, will promote that sort of subscription model quite heavily. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that you're a uh, WoW player because it's come up quite a bit uh, oh, yes. before. I know you have at least one level 60, if not more. I have more level 60s than I have <laughs> fingers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. That's kind of scary. Um, so that's a lot of hours you put in. Not working on Vanguard. That's why it's so late because of all the WoW playing. You know, I, I actually think about it as working on Vanguard in one way because knowing your competition is, is mm-hmm. really success in the industry. Mm-hmm. It's such a new such a new industry. Everything yeah. that one of our competitors does could literally change the direction of our entire industry at this stage. Yeah. So i got to be in there. I, you know, yeah. playing Jedi and Galaxies, right. you know, playing EQ2, uh, all the games in beta, all the games in release that I can possibly get my hands on. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's an obvious smart thing to do for any developer i mean on on our side of the fence whenever we see say a real-time strategy game that is not you know designing with the conventional wisdom like you know you could argue well they're not being original enough but there's certain things that after a while are just the convention that's so true. if i can't like right click on a unit say yeah interface. Then i'm thinking what the hell are you thinking yes and that's certainly starting to be true in massively multiplayer games um every every major MMO kind of becomes a manual for the next one that comes yeah. out. And if you if you deviate significantly from that in terms of player control or interface, you're just going to confuse a lot of people mm-hmm. out of the gate. Mm-hmm. So we hope to be pretty familiar to people who are playing the modern games today. And did you have to give them more than just a feeling like, well, I've done this already? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. From the very beginning. Um, you know, one of the things that was a vanguard tenant uh, back in the day when we first started talking about making another fantasy MMO people said to us well you really can't give us that first kiss experience yeah. we've already had our first kiss yeah. PvP and UO mm-hmm. uh, or raiding with our guild in EverQuest and I don't think it's ever going to feel the same you're never going to give this, give us that back mm-hmm. uh, we sat down and made a long list of things that we thought could help our game recover that feeling one of those things was you know, amazing vistas. We took Keith Parkinson's art direction and tried to make a video game that was representative of his most detailed oil paintings uh, where you could see amazing sights off in the distance that kind of pulled you into the game world mm-hmm. and make, made you want to explore and level up. And I think we were pretty successful in that 
when I run around in the game now, when I put my player's hat on and I, I drop all the developer uh, stuff and look at the game from a player's perspective, it does draw me in in that way, and it mm-hmm. does feel new. You know, I even try not to immerse myself in the lore of some of the dungeons and stuff like that so I can find it out through the game as a player, and I mm-hmm. think it'll resonate with people. Mm-hmm. It, we did recapture that to at least uh, some extent. Mm-hmm. Well, now, the reason I asked you about WoW in the first place was, you know, hearing you talk about this stuff and recapturing the first kiss in a way, like, you were a great many gamers first kiss, as it were, with this genre, right? I mean, you and Most Brad, definitely. I mean, there was, obviously was Ultima Online before before EverQuest, and there was Meridian 59, there were others, but EverQuest was really the first really big one, the first one that, that convinced a lot of people to do it. Yeah, the first mainstream, I think. I think so, too, yeah. yeah. Uh, we put it in the Hall of Fame a little while ago. Um, but... Now, you know, with with WoW sort of dominating the scene, like, uh, do you, do you like, resent their success at all? Does it bug you at all? Not you, at all. You know? Actually, you know, not only as a gamer but a developer, I love what they've been able to do. I remember the days when we first started talking about doing Vanguard that people said, well, you know, the market's tapped out. Mm-hmm. You've already got you've you've reached for every man's wallet, mm-hmm. and you've gotten the wallets that are, that are there that mm-hmm. are going to hand you money. Uh, that that's all the subscribers that there <laughs> ever will be. Mm-hmm. And we just looked at one another and we're like, you know, wow, I know people who will love MMOs. My personal friends who have just not been able to break the barrier of entry. Yeah, they're, they're not PC people or whatever the case may be. Uh, we knew that there were a lot of lot more people out there, and of course, WoW has proven that. And I think there are a lot more people than WoW has exposed. Mm-hmm. Wait until you see the first massively multiplayer sports games. Yeah, I mean, come on, that yeah. it's gonna uh, look at how popular fantasy football is. Look at how popular uh, EA sports games are on Xbox, you know, 360 Live, so on and so forth. Put all that stuff together in a massively multiplayer fantasy football where mm-hmm. you're running through the seasons, where the actual players are represented and can be traded, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Where you can jump into the individual player as an MMO, as a sports MMO player, and manipulate that individual player with his strengths and skills and weaknesses. People will eat it up. It's just mm-hmm. a matter of time before it shows up. Mm-hmm. Especially if there were guns in the oh, game. Oh, yes. Right. If I could, like, round the bases, firing you know, yep. that'd be awesome. It, it'll it'll be coming down the pike. Massively multiplayer racing, uh, uh-huh. et cetera, et cetera. Right, pick, racing. Pick any game. Yeah, yeah. Like Motor City Online was way ahead of its time. Yep. Too Auto, far. Auto Assault. I don't understand exactly what happened there. I mean, I shouldn't like talk about it like it's dead because it's still live. So I'm sorry, NCSoft. <laughs> <laughs> I would have played it if it was a little more Mad Max. Yeah, it was probably a little too EQ, huh? Yeah. EQ in cars. A little we too were, generic for me. Yeah, I think we were all hoping more for, you know, exactly, like a Mad Maxi sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Something I could, you know, something based in some known IP or something mm-hmm. of that nature. So do you believe, I mean, it's funny because somebody just asked me this question too, like, well, now that WoW has this many million people, like, is that it now? And really <laughs> I answered what, what you did because... Back then, people said that about the few hundred thousand playing EverQuest, right? Absolutely. So do you actually think that, that it's going to happen again, that at some point we'll say, wow, how quaint it was that we thought that the MMO audience was tapped out at $4 million with WoW? Absolutely. I, I'm sure it'll happen again. I mean, there's there's developing countries that are going to be avid MMO players, uh, and there's a whole lot of people that these games have yet to reach. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so... There's two things you're going to have to try to do here, which is convince those playing WoW to try your game, right? Absolutely. And develop the new audience, mm-hmm. right? I mean, because it seems to me like you won't succeed if you don't. you got to get some of those WoW people, right? Because they'll be the early adopters into your game. Absolutely. So, you know, all the people who played EverQuest, EverQuest 2, uh, some of the other uh, earlier core games, uh, it's one of those things where we have to, as best we can within mm-hmm. our genre, appeal to just about everyone uh, and then start a pretty solid marketing campaign to get the word out to new people. Mm-hmm. And you feel confident about your ability to do that? Well, the toughest part is going to be reaching the new people because it, it's arguable as to where they're hiding and how to reach them. Yeah. I mean, at that point, uh, you, you can follow some fairly interesting marketing concepts. Uh, you know, for instance, 
third edition D&D had an unusual marketing concept where they went primarily after uh, the folks they called the mavens. A good example is the guy who you know in the office who's into stereos. He knows everything about stereo equipment. Anytime somebody wants to buy a new stereo, you have no choice but to go to that guy because Mm -hmm. he knows what the hottest product is on the market. He knows what you need to buy, what speakers you need, so on and so forth. Um, You appeal to those mavens, and you let them talk about your game. So you find those guys, wherever they're hiding, for Mm -hmm. whatever genre, whether it's Magic the Gathering, a lot of people who play Magic Mm -hmm. play MMOs, um, you got to know where to ferret them out, how to reach them. These guys must be on your forums already, I would think. A lot of them are. But, you know, going to their forums, you know, find a right. you know, Magic the Gathering online forum, go to their forums and talk to them about the game that they're missing. They mm-hmm. like playing online games. There's a card game inside Vanguard Saga of Heroes that actually matters to you as an adventurer, a crafter, mm-hmm. a harvester, uh, socialized, you know, a socializing player, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. That's, um, that's going to be the tough part about ferreting out the new person. Mm-hmm. What magazines do they subscribe to? What are they doing today other than playing WoW or another one of the, or EVE, you know, mm-hmm. what, whatever massively multiplayer game out there that would appeal to them? Mm-hmm. How do you find them and reach them and, and draw their attention to your product? Right. Actually, yeah, you mentioned EVE, and that's true. That's a good example of a game that is somehow, you know, it's doing its thing. It's doing it's, well on its own. It's viral. Yeah. I mean, they, start, yeah. they started a game. They, they had a fantastic premise. All players in one world, strong PvP, uh, you know, all or nothing. Your ship mm-hmm. is gone. It's gone forever. Mm-hmm. It takes a long time to build it. So people who have hardcore gameplay styles uh, find a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of value for their time invested in a game like that. And from that point on, it's viral marketing. Mm-hmm. The guy who you knew, who you PvP'd with in UO, who always knew the best exploits, mm-hmm. he always knew how to kill the other guy, that guy may be playing Eve right now. You still got him on your on your uh, you know, your trillion message list, and you ask him what he's doing, or he just posts you know, his Eve icon saying what he's doing in Eve, and then you know there's got to be a game that a gamer who's like-minded is enjoying today. Right. So you go and buy a copy. Right. So the... Uh the reputation of, of Vanguard so far, or a lot of it, has been about its hardcoreness. Yes. And when I was at uh, the event that you guys held a few weeks ago, you seemed to be going to some um, extra pains to sort of demystify that. It, Absolutely the case. Um, you know, back in the in the infancy of Vanguard, before we were even talking about Vanguard Saga of Heroes, we were just talking about a spiritual successor to EverQuest, keeping keeping a subscription model game uh, flowing and making sure that customers feel welcome, welcome to join the game, welcome to rejoin the game after they've gone for a tour of duty overseas uh, or their job has taken them away to, you know, an offshore oil drilling rig for three months, whatever the case may be. In, in some of the more modern MMOs, that, those types of events are closed door. You've lost contact with your guild. You've lost you've mm-hmm. lost uh, knowledge of the progression curve. An expansion has come out. Now you feel kind of lost. You don't know anything about the Outland, and you don't have a flying mount, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, so it makes it very difficult to think about coming back to the game and rejoining. There's obviously a huge learning curve. Um, designing a game that welcomes a player who has 20 minutes to play who hasn't played in one day or hasn't played in 20 days or 200 days is something that's pretty key. Every time you launch an expansion or you do live content, it's got to reinvest the players that you have and the players that you would like to return to your to your subscription game. Uh, so Vanguard was literally envisioned from that from that standpoint. And while I would call it a more challenging game than WoW, it's also intended to be more rewarding for that challenge. It's kind of, mm-hmm. those two things go hand in hand. Think of, you know, a really good dungeon master. If you ever played Dungeons and Dragons in college or something of that nature, uh, you know, when you're investing an evening's time uh, expecting some entertainment, you like to be challenged, not necessarily frustrated mm-hmm. beyond a certain point. Um, certainly not necessarily as frustrated as games like UO, UO might have left you after you got PK'd and lost mm-hmm. all your stuff, or EQ might have left you after you spent 15 hours trying to camp a rare spawn only to have some level 50 wizard show up and gank it mm-hmm. and then log back off. How about uh, leveling down? That was always my favorite. Oh, request. yes. 
Le- leaving my gaming session at the end of the night lower level than I started. Yeah, that's <laughs> that, that sort of thing is, you know, it's very unlikely to expect the modern gamer to put up with those things. Uh, so yeah. keeping that barrier to entry and re-entry low and making making the game feel like a welcome place well, was huge on our list from day one. Um, you can solo to 50 in Vanguard. Mm. Uh, you're very much encouraged to group, but even more in- than just encouraging you to group, we're encouraging you to make friends mm-hmm. because it's not the group that keeps you coming back after six months. Right. It's your friends. Right. We've heard it time and time again. Right. And we feel the same way ourselves. Yeah. I wouldn't be logging on and playing WoW right now if my guild didn't need me as a tank. Uh, or need me to fill in with any one of my other alt characters uh, where where necessary. Uh, you know, any good guild needs competent players. They need the social glue of people who who are friendly and who and who enjoy these games, who keep people coming on, coming back on and playing month after month, year after year. Mm-hmm. Can't do without it. Mm-hmm. At the uh, at the demo, I was really impressed by the uh, the low level mounts. I thought that was a really clever idea. Oh, yes. We made a big world uh, back uh, in the very early days of Vanguard when we were running around our test maps trying to decide if we were making them large enough, if they felt real. You know, mm-hmm. the castle in the distance, is it far enough away? Mm-hmm. Does it give you that sense of wonderment? Uh, we realized pretty early on that mounts were going to have to be a, a player entitlement starting at earlier levels. Right. And it seemed like it seems like it's not like just sort of like trying to one-up Wow, like, well, we, we have them at level 10 instead of 40 because you actually Not sort of all. did this nice, you know, it's kind of like a, it's like a crappy horse, you know. It's yeah. like enough to get it's you by, nag. but it's a yeah. nag. <laughs> it's a nag. But you still got to earn the better bounce oh, right, yes. over time. Yeah, that becomes part of your progression, actually. Mm-hmm. Leveling up your character, leveling up, getting better mounts, faster mounts, crafting better horseshoes and armor and all that sort of good stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, you still can't fight, though, on the horses, right? You, you or, won't be able to fight on horseback at launch, but after launch, mounted combat's definitely on the list. Mm-hmm. That's either going to be great or it's going to suck. That's my professional opinion. Well, <laughs> we envisioned mount, mounted combat really early on in development, so a lot of the systems that we built, for instance, the player skills... Uh, the actual player classes and their jobs kind mm-hmm. of dovetail very neatly into mounted combat. Mm-hmm. Um, expect kind of a rock uh, versus paper versus scissors mm-hmm. uh, sort of approach where the mounted player uh, is poor at spell casting and poor at archery, for uh, instance, right. but able to deliver a devastating charge. The, uh, the infantry player who has things like a pole arm or spear uh, has mm-hmm. great defense against charging mounted mm-hmm. characters um, on a mount you can easily outflank another player and mm-hmm. deal massive damage but then again you're easy to shoot at as well because your your movement is very predictable so right. you're vulnerable to arrows you're vulnerable right. to spells if you get knocked off you can be seriously hurt stunned mm-hmm. all sorts of interesting things like that um, you'll see You'll see large PvP melees, I expect, with certain people mounted for one reason yeah. or another and yeah. certain people dismounted. Right. Certain people using missile weapons. Will people be able to fire arrows, you think, from their horses, like uh, horse archers? or Most yeah. definitely, although it'll be less effective to, to utilize archery from the back of a mount than it will be from the ground. Mm-hmm. Shorter range, less accuracy. Very rock, paper, scissors. You're not going to be able to kill the animals, are you? No. I'm pretty sure your mount won't actually participate in combat with you as a pet. Okay. That'd be kind of sad. Yeah. I don't think you're going to be able to do that. Although the mount may likely have stamina and things like that. So right. So executing your special abilities and sprinting, uh, using some of like the flanking attacks will probably draw mount stamina. And, of course, all that breaks into flying mounted mm-hmm. combat later mm-hmm. on where stamina and the ability to stay aloft matter. Yeah. See, that when I picture whether I'm going to play or not or what I want to do in the game, that's the thing. I, I picture, like, being in a flying mount, you know, yes. raining terror down on absolutely you know, lobies. Death from above. Ha- happy, yeah. And flying mounted combat would work the same way, pretty much rock, paper, scissors, where you're fantastic diving from above, mm-hmm. but when you're flapping along in a straight line, anyone can hit you with an arrow because they know where mm-hmm. you're going to be. And that seems like it'd be equally fun. Yes. Just be sniping 
morons Ab- flying above you. Absolutely. Yeah. Would they actually fall off their mount? Have you thought about that? Like, oh, yes. We we oh, absolutely God. have thought yeah, about okay. that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I died twice in demos earlier this morning falling off my mount. Yeah. Yep. Okay. See, right there, I'm probably going to play. Oh, yeah. Just the, to do that. The ability to, like, shoot somebody off their mount <laughs> yeah. with a spell <laughs> yeah. as they fly by. Yeah. Right. Very cool. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Yeah. We're, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, player-crafted ships, and, of course, the first question there is how about ship-to-ship combat. Again, right, right. We, won't, we won't have ship-to-ship combat at launch, but looking post-launch, uh, the ability to mount a cannon on your ship and go cruising past the newbie yard and mm-hmm. blow up a few newbies on the PvP server. I think you mentioned that um, on the demo day that like if your ship was destroyed in a fight, it's not... It's obviously not gone forever, right? But it will require a repair or something. Something of that nature, kind of yeah. like the the corpse of your player. Maybe you can, you know, pay some gold or uh, devote some crafting skill or resources to putting it back together, and it would appear in the world like a corpse, mm-hmm. kind of like flotsam. You go click on your flotsam, right. and Rebuild it, right? Um, okay. So speaking of corpses, and then I don't know how much time bucks you have. How are we doing? Thirty minutes. Okay. Um, so let's talk about death in Vanguard because there's been some, you know, I don't spend a whole lot of time trolling the message boards or, or your message boards because I have to troll my own. But I, I do know that some people have been have been bitching about um, your guy's death mechanism or maybe not understanding it or maybe understanding it and not liking it. Yes. So, so what is your take on death in Vanguard? Well, in all honesty, death is one of those elements of frustration that exists in these games uh, for for one reason or another in general uh, to make you appreciate the fact that you've achieved something, some sort of goal. You've avoided death and whatever mm-hmm. sting uh, the particular massively multiplayer game attaches to it. Um, it's almost inarguable that the death mechanic uh, is, is factored into subscription numbers. So mm-hmm. when you're looking at a death mechanic, depending on how much of a penalty there is, uh, you're effectively, if you decide to be very hardcore, limiting your potential number of subscribers. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to make a challenging game, uh, one that appeals to the achiever, uh, that, that remains an open door to the average person. Um, so picking the appropriate death mechanic to reward players who manage to achieve is uh, it's one of our primary goals. Uh, I think that we're going to end up with uh, a death mechanic that is kind of dynamic based on mob difficulty. Uh, okay. So the harder the mob gets, the more uh, money or the more experience you may lose when you die uh, and want to recover your corpse. Uh, whether or not we have a corpse recovery mechanic uh, at, at launch remains under debate. Right now, the way the system is set up, you only have to recover your corpse if you're killed by the most powerful mobs in the game, like literally hmm. the most powerful okay. mobs in the game. Uh, so in, in the dynamic threat 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 system, we have you know different dots that denote uh, mob difficulty, and a six-dot mob is the most powerful. And when one of those kills you, you have to run back and get your corpse. But that may end up being part of an alternate rule set. We're not absolutely mm-hmm. sure right now. Okay, so what happens right now if I'm level six and I get killed by a goat? If you get killed by the goat, uh, you can run over to the altar where you respawn and just mm-hmm. pull your corpse back to you for about eight copper. Okay. Which is really cheap. So it's a cheap money hit. Yeah, it's a little money hit right now. And if you go to recover your corpse, if you basically make the run back right. to where you died, you get a little bit of the experience you lost back. Okay. Um, so in general, I Not all of it, though. Not all of it. Um, but it's not more than just a couple of level-appropriate kills. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a sting. Um, I can tell you... Uh, doing some stupid stuff fairly fairly recently down by the riverbank, trying to kill some crocodiles that were way over my level. I mm-hmm. died like four times mm-hmm. and didn't end up progressing for about my hour's worth of time invested, <laughs> and that's the last time that I'm going to do that. <laughs> but you didn't. You can't level down, right? Nope. Can't lose a level. Thank you. Yeah, okay. you don't. You don't lose your skills. You don't lose your level. Uh, and in general, you don't. You don't really suffer from loss at all in the game. Um, so you don't lose your items. They don't decay right. or anything like that because it's just one of those things. Uh, nowadays, you invest time in a massively multiplayer game, and you want to walk away with what you earned mm-hmm. for your time invested. 
So if I have just recently leveled up and I get killed five times in a row, does it? I just stop. Stop. There's a point at which I just don't lose any more XP. That's correct. So I've just hit the rock bottom of level. Yeah, I memory. think in some cases you might then start accruing debt. <laughs> so you can you uh-huh. basically get into a hole, but you can dig yourself out, and you don't lose your your place in line. So probably don't play stupid is the advice that. Yeah, we definitely aren't going to reward somebody who plays stupid um, or just take you know takes their gear off, for instance, and goes running across the world <laughs> trying to see how many corpses they can create <laughs> so they can create lag for other players or something of that nature. Who would ever do anything like that? Yeah. Well, it's actually, I don't think it's ever happened in any game. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can there be uh, trains in Vanguard? There certainly can be trains, but awesome. they're they're a little bit friendlier than other trains. Uh-huh. Um, you know, in in a manner similar to WoW, those trains don't automatically aggro on everyone they pass by. Yeah. Unless there's a bug. There have been a few bugs in beta. I saw a guy run by me a couple of days ago with a pride of lions on his heels. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that guy's going to die. And sure enough, he did. Unfortunately, he ran by me a little too closely. Oops. And then the pride of lions was on my heels. Yeah. And I had to run. I think I ran about two kilometers before they leashed back to where Mm -hmm. they belonged. I thought that was definitely one of the better wow innovations. Not innovation. It was more like a refinement. Yes. Um, Preventing the the grief ability of training. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if the mob leashes back, it evades the whole way back. It doesn't gain aggro on anyone Mm -hmm. else. You can't catch it in an AOE and aggro it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And we'll end up doing something that is that is for Vanguard purposes uh, functionally identical to that. And God, sure. m- remember the shame that you would have yourself if you caused a train, like an oh, EverQuest? Absolutely. I would log off because I would just feel so absolutely. bad and humiliated. Here's that ass who trained, you know. Yep. I'd have to, like, go away. Yep. I'm sorry. And it could be pretty bad. You could yeah. just wipe out an entire zone <laughs> full of people if you weren't careful. Yeah. If I got too much shit, I would just, like, train them again. Like, exactly. Okay, fine. <laughs> I'm a jerk. Take and this then now. customer service would <laughs> would get the petitions. Yeah. All of those things. It's just one of those issues where uh, that that whole scenario, the customer service getting the petition, designing a system where your CS people don't ever have to get involved, allows you to take the money that they that they would have had to be paid and put it back into de- developing the game. Mm-hmm. So building a game that's generally free of the need for customer service is the smartest thing to do. Yeah. That's, I mean, to me, that seems like a huge advantage that you and Brad have is you're obviously coming into this very much with your eyes open. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's the mistake you see with other MMO developers, I think, is that they don't realize that what they're making is actually like a service and not a product. That's true. Uh, It's a service like, like any other thing, you know, running an airline, uh, what have you, uh, operating a t- cable TV station, you have to you have to understand that your product is it has to be updated, it has to be maintained, you have a live team, you have expansions, you have customer service, and everything that you do, all the game design elements have to be set up like an amusement park where mm-hmm. the game is meant to flow. People come in, people go out, they experience the content, um, and at times they... They may leave the game. You got to welcome them back. You got to give mm-hmm. them a reason to come back, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. It was really amazing to me that I, I spent the, the weekend playing EverQuest One, your your old game. And it was amazing past. to me how uh, how much it's actually changed now in response. Obviously, the graphics haven't really, but in response to not just WoW, but I guess everything that's come after. Very true. Um, but it did remind me how. It originally, how really kind of unfriendly it was. I don't think deliberately you weren't saying, like, let's make an unfriendly, mean oh, game. Not at all. It was just more like the convention at the time. That's true. I mean, back in the day, we remember conversations between developers where, you know, some element of frustration, either in UO or EverQuest, would be brought up, um, either by a player or another developer. You know, I didn't care for X, Y, or Z. And sometimes the response would be, well, you know, then design a better system because mm-hmm. we're looking at the game and we haven't come up with something to fix this particular element of frustration. And so the way the game plays right now is the only way we could figure out to make it right? Um, or the way we had time to code it or whatever else the case may be. Um, being able to identify what 
you know, what what elements of design were the underpinnings of EverQuest's success and which ones hampered EverQuest's success mm-hmm. that was, you know, that all of that was our early goals in, in concepting Vanguard mm-hmm. when we still had everything on a piece of paper and it was 12 guys in an office uh, talking about and envisioning the game that we were going to mm-hmm. build, distilling EverQuest, UO, and the other products that were mm-hmm. on the market for what made them a success and what hampered their success, mm-hmm. what reduced their subscriber base mm-hmm. uh, was was one of our key goals. So what do you think like, are at least a couple of the things that were successes to you in EQ1 that still carry over now to Vanguard all these years later? One of the things that, uh, that we've actually struggled with uh, in terms of design was the the entertainment value of fear or suspense. Uh, the fact that in EverQuest you could ostensibly die and lose your corpse because your yeah. corpse would decay after a certain period of time. Um, as you were exploring an area uh, that you weren't familiar with, there was real danger. You could mm-hmm. lose hundreds of hours of mm-hmm. your personal achievement. Um, and because of that, it instilled an, a sense of fear you know, what's around the corner of that next dungeon corridor? I don't know, and I'm not going to find out. Let's wait till somebody else goes down there and gives us a report. Well, there could be a trap door there. We could fall through to a lower level of the dungeon and never make it back out, and our corpses would rot because we're the highest level players in the game right now. Uh, that happened, that situation, that exact situation happened to us quite a few times, running up through EverQuest in the early beta. And... Uh, that's one element that is very difficult to capture because it's tied so strongly to frustration. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't really take hundreds of hours of players' progress away. So in modern MMOs, I find that element of entertaining sorely lacking. Mm-hmm. You know, there is no fear. I have no fear when I'm leveling up in WoW or I'm raiding. Mm-hmm. I'm not really going to lose anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I miss that. Mm-hmm. So trying to... Trying to engineer that into Vanguard has been quite a challenge, mm-hmm. for sure. I uh, when I was playing EverQuest One, I was and I've seen all these things that they've added now to make it easier and friendlier. It was amazing to me to think back that this game used to not have things like a map, mm-hmm. like you just didn't. You had to know where you were going, yep. or you had to like map it out, like you know, in the old days with like graph paper graph or something. Paper. Um, let's see what else didn't it have. Um, there, well, there really what there were quests, but there wasn't any kind of quest log or whatever. Yep, you had to keep a notebook. Right. Yep, you had to write down the NPC name who gave you the quest, write down where he was at, uh, and just go from there. Mm-hmm. And many times I didn't know where to turn the quest in. You know, that wasn't paying attention, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were there were quite a few elements of gameplay that uh, that are in modern games that were lacking in EQ. Mm-hmm. People are people are just so lazy now. You know, like when when I'm I'm playing WoW. Eh, back in my day, we didn't have maps. That's, I don't mean it yep. that way. I just mean that you know, like when you you log on to WoW, and they give you everything. I mean, you've got a map. They put yellow dots on the map. You've got the quest log. You've got how many of this thing you need, and then you still get people going. Where's you know? Where's Dingleberry? You know, and it says like right there in the quest. You know, Dingleberry standing in the in the tavern of whatever. Well, I actually have to, I had to laugh. Uh, just this morning, in fact, somebody was talking to me about some Star Wars Galaxies functionality that doesn't exist in the basic WoW client, the ability to mark a waypoint. Oh, right. You yeah. Know, here, here I mark a waypoint in the middle of Elwyn Forest uh, where Princess, the, the boar, spawns. Uh-huh. And, you know, that's relevant because that's where all of my alts go through and I want to email that that waypoint to you because you've mm-hmm. just started to play on my server mm-hmm. and you've never played Alliance before. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that we could do in Star Wars Galaxies that we can't in WoW. Mm-hmm. And as these games evolve, if you were to if you were to sit down today and take Vanguard WoW, all of the WoW interface expansions sure. that have come out and combine them all and and derive from that a subset of needed elements for what the fourth generation game is going to have to provide the Mm -hmm. players on day one you need a 150 man development team (laughs) you need a full five years Mm -hmm. and an ungodly budget Mm -hmm. to put it all together because that's what players are going to ask for Mm -hmm. you know and if you don't give it to them they'll find a way to make it themselves look at all the wow mods right you know they're going to they're going to modify the game to play in the manner that they choose or or they, they find most appealing 
and then the the mods themselves are going to evolve over the years to be specifically what the players are looking for. Mm-hmm. So uh, going into Vanguard then, do you guys feel like are you mod open and you know are you welcoming them most definitely to your uh-huh. and in fact some of the mods that exist for the modern games uh, out there right now are reflected in some core functionality in vanguard mm-hmm. you know the the way uh, if you've ever played wow and experienced decursive you know anytime somebody in your party gets a curse placed on them uh, or some other affliction that your character class has the ability to cure you get a little pop up you know a little <laughs> pop up it tells you what the affliction is and you mm-hmm. just click on the icon right next to it and your character targets Targets them and removes scrubs the mm-hmm. the debuff or whatever it is automatically. Mm-hmm. Um, that works very similar to the reaction system in Vanguard, where mm-hmm. if uh, you've got someone as your defensive target and they're taking damage, your tank, you can rescue them and intercept the damage that they're taking, and you get an icon that pops up on your screen. You've got a hotkey that automatically executes that, or you can click it with your mouse. Mm-hmm. So it's like a mod. Mm-hmm. So thinking about not only the games that are out there, but what players are are trying to get out of them that maybe they don't even offer. Right. Waypoints in WoW that they had in Star Wars Galaxies, decursive, things mm-hmm. of that nature, things like damage meters, threat meters, you name it. That's mm-hmm. that's what everyone wants. I think even EverQuest 1 now has, uh, uh, not waypoints, but you, know, you can get that little trail yeah. leading to the next thing. The little thing. silver thread. Right. Yeah. Which was, which was amazing to me to see. I think Neocron was the first game that had that that actual thread to lead you someplace, mm-hmm. and Star Wars Galaxies picked up on it mm-hmm. because their cities were complex. And you mm-hmm. know, if the qu- if there was a quest NPC or a trainer, if you didn't know where it was, there was no way to find it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they instituted the little uh, system of lines and arrows that you could follow along on the ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was smart. Yep. It works, and that's another added element of complexity in these games. I mean, people come into a 3D world space, they're unfamiliar with it, and if you don't find a way to let them know about your world and where they are, where to get around, then you've got one day, one hour, 30 mm-hmm. days before they quit. It seemed back in, in the EQ1 days that you, that you were almost deliberately um, secretive about the geography, like... I remember, uh, you know, being a magazine editor back then, and we were, like, trying to get maps out of you guys. That, like, we, we thought it would be cool if we could print, you know, this area, and you, and there was this real sort of hesitancy. Like, we oh. want the players to figure this out on yeah, their own. I remember it well. Um, that was back in the day uh, when the thinking was that all elements of the game other than the very first entry-level experience, was a reward for player mm-hmm. achievement. Look, mm-hmm. you want to know your way around uh, Nectalos Forest. Mm-hmm. You've got to level up, or mm-hmm. you've got to get somebody in your guild who knows. Mm-hmm. That's the reward that the game offers. Um, I think as these products have evolved, we've you know, we've come to learn that it's the actual gameplay, the knowledge of the intricacies mm-hmm. of the encounters yeah. and, the, and the dungeons. And, you know, don't turn left and kill that mini boss first. You've got to go mm-hmm. to the right and get the two mini bosses that mm-hmm. spawn before mm-hmm. you kill him for the following reason. That's where player knowledge right. uh, seems to reside. People are a little bit more happy with yeah. that. In a way, too, it might have been uh, the Internet that helped sort of maybe in a way force developers to have to sort of give up that kind of notion because like EQ Alakazam Atlas. and EQ Atlas, that was yes. right. That's the one. You know, yeah. it's it's one of those things where if you don't create EQ Atlas, someone else is going to come and do it for you. Yeah. And then even those things that you did hold aside as player knowledge and reward are given to every player at low level. Right. Uh, ThoughtBot's a good example of that as yeah. well. What's my gear progression for a Taran Hunter yeah. from 30 to 40? Well, ThoughtBot will probably tell me that if that's what I want to know. I yeah. can experience it in the game, or I can just go find out mm-hmm. very quickly. Again, I, I guess I just have I have mixed feelings about it all, because it feels like like you're kind of right in a way that there it seems like something gets a little lost in all of this being so easily available to everybody. I mean, on the other Certainly hand, you don't want to be like an elitist, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it would be it would be tough from a developer standpoint to prevent people uh, from honestly obtaining that information and displaying it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things. I, a lot of times, I look at the Japanese RPGs, and if you take 
if you take the console Japanese RPG uh, as a cross section and you look at what the players seem to seek and what they're willing to invest their money in, and I'm not just talking about the money that they spent on the original game, Mm -hmm. but they'll go in years afterwards and they'll buy every manual and every reference work that that shows a picture of every weapon in the game in the hands of every single character, race, and class, every suit of armor in the game worn by every single race and class, Um, the stats detailed out for every single monster and its appearances throughout every level range. People really like those collections of information, mm-hmm. and they and they pay they pay good money for those things. Um, the websites that compile that stuff get massive amounts of traffic. Mm-hmm. They get bought up and they become very popular. Um, I think what we'll end up doing, uh, at least for the near future, is allowing the people outside of Sigil to yeah. pursue that. Uh, will remain as closed-mouthed about those facts as possible, uh-huh. and we'll let people gather those details, and that way right. the players in the game can choose to pursue that information, right. or they can play the game fresh. Right, and the great thing is, like, it's, that information will be out there, and it will have cost you zero, zero time yes. and, and effort on your own. Yeah, right? and I at mean, some point like in time... people doing your work for, you know, for yeah. you. At some point in time, maybe we'll offer a compilation, you know, right. in, the, in the manner of some of the Final Fantasy... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Single player RPGs, and right, but hell, I mean, you know, Blizzard doesn't get anything out of Thoughtbot, right? I mean, that's absolutely not a gigantic encyclopedia that they had nothing to do with. So, yep, nothing, why should you bother? Yep, nothing to do with at yeah. all. And you know, a lot of the content is kind of spoiled there. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you know, I was I was playing WoW just earlier today, and uh, just with a Lobie character that so it's already it was in Wetlands, so it's something I've already been through ten times, but I had to turn in this quest uh, that was somewhere in the middle of the zone. I could not remember for the life of me where the guy was. Yep. And I just sat there like, like, okay, I could alt tab and go to ThoughtBot or I can actually like play the game and find him myself. And I said, okay, I'm going to give myself like two more minutes to find him. And then I'm going to ThoughtBot. Yep. And then I waited about 30 more seconds and then I just went to ThoughtBot. And there 